Welcome to another episode of GraphQL Radio Season 2. We have a very special guest today, one of my former co-workers, Marc-André Giroux, who used to work at Shopify, then at GitHub, and is now at Netflix. And thus has seen probably more production, high-scale GraphQL APIs than most people on the planet. He's also the author of Production Ready GraphQL, a great book that you should absolutely buy if you are running GraphQL in production. Many, many valuable lessons that he's learned, and I'm sure we're going to get into a bunch of them today. I'm Max Stoiber. I'm one of the co-founders of Graphstudian, and I'm here with Abby Iyer, my co-host. Abby. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching our show, or listening, rather. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Back when we went to conferences and we all saw each other a lot, it's been a long time. There are a lot of things that have happened. What's life looking like for you these days now that you're at Netflix? Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. For First of all, I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to have today. Life's been great. Life's been great. Uh, as Max said, it's been an interesting experience going from uh, working on GraphQL for so long, actually, for I guess like GraphQL is probably like six or seven years old right now, uh, seeing like how it's being implemented at a bunch of companies. And now at Netflix, which has been my dream company for a while, ever since I was reading that Netflix tech blog, I've always wondered what it was truly like so it's been it's been really great so far thanks for thanks for having me on of course well let's actually dive right into that you know originally maybe why don't we start with what did you actually work on at shopify and github like what were your responsibilities and maybe also a little bit of what you learned there and then what are you what team are you on at netflix as far as you can say of course what are you actually working on at netflix and what does netflix use graphql for maybe give us a little bit of an overview over your journey and how you sort of got through from you know six seven years ago from not knowing graphql to now being Mark andre Giroux. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I was working on the, I was working at Shopify. That's been a while already. Um, I was working on a team that basically took care of GraphQL, the GraphQL platform. But before that, I actually started by just implementing something in GraphQL at Shopify. Uh, Shopify's approach was very special because the decision to go towards GraphQL came from the CEO, <laughs> which is not something you hear a lot. Often people are like, were asking me, like, how do you convince the org to use GraphQL? Like, I want to use GraphQL, it's so cool, but uh, my CTO doesn't want to. For me at Shopify, it was like, we were basically told to by the CEO to use GraphQL, which is, which is always nice to have that, that support. So uh, early on, it was just me implementing features. I think I was part of the checkout team back then. And then I moved on to kind of like that more platformy team that made sure writing GraphQL APIs uh, was a good experience at Shopify. So Shopify was a giant Ruby on Rails monolith. Um, so the way we approached GraphQL was was similar. It was written in that monolith in Ruby. So I think back then I gave a conference talk at GraphQL Summit, and I met the folks from GitHub there who were giving a similar presentation with a similar setup. GitHub is a giant Ruby on Rails monolith, but they actually had published or were about to publish their API public, uh, which I think was probably the first like truly public GraphQL API out there, or at least the biggest one. Like that and Yelp? Yep, Yelp, that's true. That's a good point. So the fact that it was public and he seemed like so hyped about it, I was kind of inspired. And Kyle Daigle, who was the director back then, uh, was like, hey, do you want to join us? So it was kind of a no-brainer. I thought it was really cool what they were working on. So I, I jumped over at GitHub, which in the end was a very, very, very similar team. So my job didn't change much. I uh, work in Ruby, building GraphQL tooling. So yeah, and I've, I've stayed at GitHub for about four years. Max, we probably were coworkers for, what, like a year or two, I guess? <laughs> short, short amount of time. I was at GitHub for one and a half years, so probably something like that. Yeah. And then just recently, I've switched over to Netflix, which is a completely different kind of architecture, as you as you know, probably like a massive, massive scale, hundreds of thousands of microservices and using kind of a federated approach to GraphQL, which is the complete opposite of what we were doing at Shopify and GitHub, like a massive monolith scheme as defined in the same place. So yeah, that's been quite a challenge, very different, which is a, honestly kind of a breath of fresh air to tackle different problems. <laughs> nice. For the people uh, listening, uh, Mark, could you explain what a federated GraphQL layer means? Yeah, absolutely. So if we take a look at just the GraphQL spec, all it needs to know is like what your schema is, what the shape of your data and use case is, and then 
you should be able to execute queries against that schema and get a response back, right? And how that schema is built is not really part of the spec. So there's multiple approaches. The kind of OG approach, the Facebook way, is more of the monolith way where you define your schema in a single code base, even in a single like deployable entity, like one service that has the entire schema and responds to queries. Since not everybody's architecture looks like Facebook, like that giant monolith, there was kind of challenges to like, where do I define that schema? Like I have hundreds of services that each own part of the business logic. So different things were invented. One of the first ones was schema stitching, which was basically you, you have this gateway in front of your services and it puts a bunch of schemas together, tries to merge them to so have that unified GraphQL API which uh, worked for a lot of people, I think. A lot of people still love that approach. But one of the downsides is that that merging logic at the gateway can be a little brittle and requires kind of like code at the gateway level, which you wanted to kind of like federate your service, be super independent. And now you have that like centralized glue to kind of attach entities that belong to different services there. So. Here comes uh, Apollo with the Federation spec, which kind of allowed people to be completely decentralized. So I define my schema here and I annotate it in ways that can tell the gateway later that to fetch, for example, a user's account, well, you need to go to the other service to get the account. And then the gateway using kind of those declarative annotations on types is able to generate a query plan and resolve a query by calling different services. So a little bit like a, a database would do, right? Like you, you send a SQL query, well, it needs to generate a, a query plan to go fetch the data from the right places, similar to that. So that's Netflix approach where I'm on a team that takes care, among other things, of that gateway that generates the query plans and is able to fetch these uh, all this data from hundreds of services. In your experience, how has working on a federated setup at Netflix differed from what was a monolith at GitHub and Shopify, right? If you compare your experience, but both from like a platform team perspective, right? From your day-to-day -day job, but also from a developer working on the API, what are the trade-offs that sort of you make in each approach? Because I'm sure both of them, as always in engineering, right? It always depends. Everything always depends. Everything always has upsides and downsides. I'm curious, in your very practical experience, what has the upside been of having a federated approach at Netflix and what has the downside been? What have you lost compared to uh, maybe the way people were building GraphQL at GitHub and Shopify? Yeah, I'll start with... Um... I guess initially, right away, you can see how implementing schema-wide best practices, for example, gets harder when everybody has the freedom to build their own schema, right? So one thing I've always loved at GitHub is that to solve a particular problem, or if we had a tool that had the potential to solve a problem, well, you implement it in one code base that everybody owns um, and it solves it for everyone. So like you can have a lot of leverage in the same code base. With Federation and especially at Netflix, which is a culture of a lot of freedom, which is amazing. One of the reasons I joined, uh, teams are, are fairly free to choose their technology and how to advance. It's a little harder though to get those conventions across the board. Uh, it requires more time. And since there's more freedom, yeah, it's just a little bit harder to implement tools across the board. Thankfully, having a gateway uh, at the center of things allows us to build tooling for like some cross-cutting concerns, but it's still not as simple as seeing the schema in a single place. You can make like large refactors easily. So that, that's one part of it. The second part of it, I think the big trade-off is like the operational complexity, like a gateway generating query plan, talking to hundreds of services is definitely more complex than a Ruby process executing a GraphQL query, right? If it was any other company, I'd be very worried since Netflix has such kind of a experience with, with, a, with that complex of an architecture. There's amazing observability that helps us debug kind of like anything going wrong with query execution. So... Yeah, that'd be the trade-off, I'd say. I've always said like the trade-off is operational complexity versus development complexity. It's very easy to contribute to a federated graph because it's your own service. You can go really quickly, but then it comes to an operational cost of like that whole query planning algorithm, the times out, timeouts, just like crossing network boundaries in general. So That really resonates. We actually see that at GraphCDN where GraphCDN kind of acts as like, a dumb gateway, in dumb in under air quotes, right, between your clients and your server. It's, it's meant to be as transparent as possible. But of course, what we've realized is that actually a lot of 
actually federation actually has a lot of traction with bigger companies. And as soon as you introduce federation, everything becomes 10 times more complicated because, of course, if individual services own their individual schema, then they also have to own their cache configuration in Grassidian's case, right? And they have to own their analytics and they have to own all of that sort of completely separately. And actually, Grassidian wasn't really built with that in mind. And we're now starting to get into that world more and more. And we're starting to add more functionality to, su to support federated APIs. But that's not something that was obvious to me from the get-go, right? It, it, it wasn't fr from the beginning. I was like, I just GraphQL, right? As, yeah. as long as we support GraphQL, surely it'll be just fine. But from a workflow perspective, as you said, from a developer experience perspective, it's much nicer. But from an operational perspective of, okay, how do we actually configure this gateway? You get a lot of overhead that I didn't anticipate before. It really goes back to like how big the product you're working on is. You know, so it really is just GraphQL for most products out there. You know, I wouldn't advise someone to go make a federated GraphQL when they're making their blog site or their intro tutorial. You know, like that's not something that you should do. Or if you're at a startup and you're you're not serving much traffic or your data model is not that complex or you're literally a team of like two people like none of this these things. I think all these things were created because big ass teams started joining the space. The, the the GitHubs of the world, and I don't think people like a lot in big companies. Teams don't necessarily like to communicate that well with each other, so we <laughs> needed tooling and schemas to enforce like you know all of us to kind of follow the same conventions. So that's pretty cool that like even Apollo is part of schema stitching. They've kind of been through this whole journey of like where are, is enterprise GraphQL really going to go. Um, so it's cool to see that Netflix has that approach as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you touched on a good point. I don't know where the line is where like Federation starts becoming a good trade off. Right? I, I'm not sure where it is, but I think it's fairly high, right? Like even I'm not sure if we felt these problems of independent schema evolution at GitHub, even with a very large schema, but you can get pretty far with good tooling. Personally, I tried to delay the decision to federate yeah. as long as possible, but I don't I do think it's a valid solution when you get to a certain scale where if you're good enough at observability and maintaining your services, it, it is a pretty ma magical solution that allows for like amazing freedom with a extremely large schema. So, yeah. I think that's also a lot of the large, the fun part of my job at Grassidian because we have, you know, thousands of customers. We see thousands of GraphQL APIs, right? And in fact, I, I was actually surprised by how low that threshold seems to be. I think pretty much every bigger company where bigger probably means more than maybe 100 engineers that we've talked to, I would actually say maybe it's even 100% or at least close to 100% uses Federation, right? And I know obviously there's like Shopify and Kitab who both don't, but from the companies that we talk to, a lot of them nowadays use Federation as soon as they have, basically as soon as they have more than five teams working on a GraphQL API. That's right? amazing. It's become yeah. sort of like the default solution from at least the APIs we see in the market where once you get to more, multiple teams working on a GraphQL API, you're probably going to use Federation. And what's also interesting is that, that there's people that I can't actually call out that I've talked to privately who, who were like, yeah, it's probably too early because actually the sort of centralized schema approach works up to a much larger point than people think, right back to your point, Mark, where you said, you know, at, at GitHub, that was still working perfectly fine. GitHub had the monolith, GitHub had the setup for it. At the time when we were there, I think there were, what, 600 engineers at GitHub, maybe? Some, somewhere Something in that order like of magnitude, that. I think. Yeah. And it was still working just fine. I don't know how much you can talk about this, but what does Netflix actually use GraphQL for? With Shopify and GitHub, there's the public GraphQL APIs that I'm sure most people know. And there's also some internal use of GraphQL, at least the GitHub that I that was there when, when I was there, which we can also get into. But I'm really curious at Netflix, is there a public GraphQL API or is it all just for your own sort of first party clients? And then how does that change your approach to building a GraphQL API if you control all the clients rather than having a public API? That's a really good question. Yeah, Netflix doesn't have a, a public API, uh, so it's all internal use cases and it does change changes things a lot it's it's a lot easier <laughs> yeah. it, it's still really hard but it's a lot easier than serving a public api you do whatever you want exactly <laughs> so every, everything related to um deprecations is still hard but a lot easier with than with a public api right like at github you deprecate a field and who knows for how long you'll have to battle <laughs> existing clients to move up that field at least internally we can we can go straight to the source generally. Honestly, at that scale, though, 
it starts approaching the complexity of a public API because uh, there's so many clients. So we still need tooling to be able to email teams that are using deprecated fields. Uh, we still make sure like every client and every subgraph is like registered. We have like their contact info where their the things are deployed, where their code are. So like tracking these things, super important as efficient scale, even internally. And then I would say the other difference is kind of how you designed your schemas. With a, with a public API, you always need to stay a bit more on the generic side of things because you don't know exactly what people are going to build. So you can't start with like, you can start with what you think people will use your API for, but there's like surprising applications out there that use the GitHub API in all sorts of wild ways. So you always need to be a bit more generic, allow for things you don't know. I think that's a good pattern in general, but for internal APIs, you can usually be more like working with existing clients that can tell you what their use cases are, example queries, and build your schemas in a much more specific way, which is awesome, honestly, uh, to just build an API that's like built for a use case rather than just exposing like, hey, here's my data. You can try to do stuff with that. <laughs> I think that's really interesting. I remember I worked on some schema changes at GitHub when I was there. And it was really tricky to design something that was generic enough to just be used externally, right? And we weren't even that concerned about the generic outside use case, but still we had to spend a lot of time, or not had to, we wanted to spend a lot of time making sure that the API was as generic as possible, even if it was maybe a, a little bit too generic for the use case that we had specifically, right? Yep. The, the team that I was on. Do you think schema design in general like, has come to like a point where people are starting to do the same things? Or is it still a wild, wild west in how schemas are being built? And I know you've blogged about this a lot, especially when it comes to mutations and just everything when it comes to like how this, this, these types are all like laid out. In, in the companies you worked with, are you seeing some type of like, you know, just similar patterns emerging? Yeah, I, I think there are patterns. We're in a much better place we were a couple of years ago, I think. There are certain things like uh, the relay kind of like schema patterns, like connections for pagination and like those global IDs that I see pretty much almost everywhere. Not everywhere, but it, they're fairly common, which we're, I'm very thankful for, honestly. <laughs> like that's at least one thing I've seen. Pagination, people that use GraphQL are used to cursor pagination now thanks to <laughs> their relay connections. They're used to kind of like those edge types, wrapper types, which I think are so key for schema evolution down the line. So I really like that pattern is there. Um, there's other stuff, especially errors, I think, that everybody is still wondering about. Like, there's some patterns emerging, like that union pattern. But even within companies, I see kind of like different patterns emerging. So, yeah, I'm I'm curious what you what do you, you guys think about this because some people have considered, hey, like, should we have a more specific spec? Like, here's how like error types should be and like pagination should be. I, on, in some ways, that would be really nice. In others, you're kind of now restricting freedom from certain GraphQL APIs. You know, even within Netflix, sometimes we hesitate giving like hard recommendations that can't be derived from because there are certain use cases where you, a relay connection just doesn't work or like the error union doesn't make sense. So um, to answer your question, though, yeah, I, I think we're in a much better place for sure. But there's still so much work to be done, especially if we see more and more public GraphQL APIs. I think there's enormous value in having kind of like known patterns so that when I integrate with a GraphQL API, I don't need to like scratch my head like, okay, what is this error? I need to yeah, spread sure. fragments and like, how do I, what is cursor based pagination? I think that's better, but yeah, I think. I think uh, the public needs to see more internal APIs because that's where things get more creative and context-based, right? You're starting to see public APIs all look the same because everyone else is looking at everyone else's API to see what's the right thing to do. That's true. But no one shares their public API, which has like, you know, weird names and like things that you'll never understand if you didn't work there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But for the error, point. let's talk about this error conversation. I think it's super interesting. It's been a long time since we've all started using GraphQL, and this topic still exists, which is funny. You know, there's been proposed, like, you know, how different companies proposed it via in responses, throwing errors. There's, like, error catching, all that type of stuff. Maybe we should just settle the debate right here and just <laughs> tell people where we stand 
And then if someone ever asks us again, they can watch this episode because I don't want to talk about errors anymore. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, where, where do you stand, Max? This is actually, this is one of the topics. I feel like the, the relay pagination has taken over a lot more than any specific error pattern, which is interesting to me. And I think the main reason is just because somebody wrote down the relay pagination spec, right? And everybody knows what that means. And just because that spec exists, most people kind of follow that spec, right? They sort of get the reason for it. Maybe they don't, maybe they do, but they usually they follow it, right? And for most use cases, it kind of makes sense. And actually, from a tooling perspective, having that and knowing that means that we can actually build support for relay pagination in various ways into our tooling, right? And it makes the tooling much better knowing how pagination works. And I, I long for people to do the same thing with errors. I long for there to be just the thing that most people do with errors. Sure, there's always going to be cases where there's going to be different errors, but most of the time, this is how you should be handling errors. That doesn't exist. Mark, in, in, in your experience, what, what have you tried and, and what has worked or not worked for returning errors from GraphQL queries? So one thing is you've got those like GraphQL errors, right? The ones that are appearing in the errors key of the response, which are part of the spec. I think we've gotten pretty much a consensus in the community that those should be reserved for like developer facing errors, like something went wrong with the query and not necessarily a product error, like um, this mm -hmm. product is out of stock, for example. So I think we at least got there most of the case, even though if you look at GitHub's public API, still uses that errors key. And I think that's going to be very hard to migrate from. So <laughs> that's one thing. Then as far as the better pattern is, I mean, the ones I've seen the most often so far is like having that mutation wrapper type, which has an errors field. And then that's an array of errors. That's in contrast with another one gaining popularity where it's not the mutation wrapper type is not an object type. It's a union type with a success type in it and then various mm -hmm. error types, which is super nice uh, because you, you, look at the, you look at your schema and you know what can happen. The reason I think it might be hard to make into a spec is one, it's hard for certain existing code bases to know what errors could happen. <laughs> First of all, there's a lot of code bases like, yeah, we catch errors and we shove them in an array is a lot easier than mapping to a specific type. And then the other one that I've noticed with the union pattern is it often handles only one error. Like you've got your success type or a product out of stock type or product whatever type. In many cases, your API actually wants to return multiple errors. So that's why I usually tend with the array solution because it's more, it's a bit more flexible and you can return multiple errors. But the downside is your schema is not telling, right? You look at an array of errors and you have no idea what's actually going to be there at runtime. So I think we can push it as far, if we were to push it like really in a nerdy way, I think probably the best pattern is like a union between success and error. And then that error type has an array of the errors that happened. And nice. within that array, errors can be one of a union <laughs> of the types uh, of the errors that can happen. And they all implement the same interface so that clients can select on an interface for like additional errors that are added in the future. Which if you took a look at that approach uh, on paper, it, there's a lot of additional types and clients need to write pretty complex queries for what seems like a simple mutation. So I'm not sure I recommend this approach. I think it's the kind of like the on paper best approach, uh, but due to its complexity, the amount of types you need to create and client, maybe it's not the best approach. So as you can see, I'm not too sure on the, be <laughs> the best approach, but I've got a bunch of ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think embedding errors is fine in whatever format. But I just worry about all the tools that you may be using that are not GraphQL aware. Mm -hmm. and so you don't want 200s on errors that may be happening. Or you're tracking HTTP 200s and you're getting a bunch of fake metrics because, you know, everything's run returning 200. And now you have to go instrument something differently and you've never done that before in your life. Like, so something, you know, these different situations that you may be in. It might be best to just throw an error and just console.error or whatever, <laughs> you know, and move on. Yep. You know, but in reality, you could just, you know, error.stack and trace and just be like, everything's a developer error. 
until you figure some pattern out for yourself, right? I'm not saying that's the one I would go with. I would go with the Mark set because that's way smarter. But uh, <laughs> no, but you've got a point, though. You've got a point. I'm sure, Max. I'm sure you've dealt with that with Graph CDN. Like, if you only get two hundreds, like I mean, that's one part of GraphQL that really sucks, right? You need to go look into the response and make sense of the data because there's no conventions. So yeah, it's a big thing. Which makes sense, right? If I'm in a world where I have a where I send maybe multiple mutations in one go, and then some of them will error, some of them will success, what's the status code of the entire request, right? Because GraphQL lets you select multiple things in one in one request, mm -hmm. having an overall status code that reflects the status of the request is kind of impossible because yeah. it, maybe different fields just have error at another time, right? So, so then what is the status code? And that's, I think, something also that I didn't realize before co-founding GraphCDN is we actually do need GraphQL-specific tooling, which sounds really ridiculous coming from me because that's what I'm doing, but it's like you do actually need GraphQL-specific tooling because it is so different than what everybody does. And it, when, when you just look at GraphQL, it doesn't look that different. I mean, obviously, it's very different, right? But these fine differences of status codes don't really make sense anymore in a world where you have GraphQL, right? Because you do actually have errors, but also maybe you have success at the same time. And all these fine differences, they add up to something to, to, to a point where many companies, they, they come to us and they're like, yeah, my tooling doesn't work anymore. Like, this is so different, even though it's kind of the same, it's so different that my tooling doesn't work anymore. And we actually do need some specific tooling, particularly around observability and error tracking. In terms of the errors, we actually, for now, have decided to, we offer error tracking, but only on the errors, sort of top level errors key in the response. So if there's like any errors in there, we'll track them and send you, and then there's like alerts and you can get emails and whatever. We haven't touched any of the schema errors because the way I think also you just described it, Mark, if I, would to, if I were to summarize your approach is like, if you have something that developers need to know about, you throw an error and it gets returned in the errors array at the top level. If you have an error that users need to care about that they need to know because they entered the wrong password, because the product is out of stock, because there's something that is related to your product, you want to encode that in the schema. And the benefit of that is that the UI can then have a list of all of the available errors and handle each one of them, right? It's like, okay, if the product is out of stock, then we need to do something in the UI, right? The client needs to handle that state specifically. Whereas if the server just sends back, like, I crashed, then obviously the UI just needs to like, that's always the same, right? The UI just shows a generic, something happened, something went wrong, we're mm -hmm. sorry, please try again, or whatever. Which I think just makes a ton of sense. It does, yeah. No, it, I mean, just the fact that, you know, like you just said, Graph CDN chose to go for the errors key first. I think a lot of us do that because that's where there's the most convention. So, like, Abby has a point in terms of, like, right now, it probably will give you better results, but long-term, I don't know. Like, we all agree that errors as part of the schema is nice, but in reality, like... So much tooling works on the errors key, as you said. So it's a it's a weird situation we're in, and like even observability, as you touched uh, on right now, there are some really tricky scenarios. Let's say the password wrong password error. If you're just like I know some people use errors like in an even simpler way, where you have a field that says like error with a string, and then that field is wrong password where there's an error. That is super hard to have observability on. So you can, with REST, like you at least have like a 422, for example, for like validation errors. And you can look at your dashboard and see a spike in 422s. That's not an internal server error, but it should probably still alert people. Like you, you don't have like passwords failing for everybody all of a sudden. And there's a lot of GraphQL APIs out there that basically are flying in the dark for validation errors where you need super custom observability to catch those kind of things. So, yeah. Yeah, you can wrap like Sentry in your resolvers and get like really into it. At some point with every GraphQL API, you're going to have to put your ops hat on and like make it way more observable, especially when it comes to like latency and stuff too. It may not be errors that gets you. Maybe like your P95 is like 30 seconds and uh, your whole app's about to crash, you know, because <laughs> you didn't observe on your resolvers to see what they were doing. No, that's a good point on P95. Like, again, if you just use like your typical observability solutions, you'll have like one dashboard slash GraphQL with a P99 yeah. on it. It literally means nothing, right? Unless things go horribly wrong, you'll see it. But if like one query is slow and one page keeps timing out, not sure at like a large scale enough, I'm not sure you'll see it on that slash GraphQL graph, right? So now you got to exactly. stop thinking in terms of endpoints and start thinking in queries. And that's all like custom tooling. So yeah, Max, as you said, we, we need GraphQL tools for sure. What's actually also interesting about the P95 response time specifically is that we actually looked at our data across the thousands of GraphQL APIs that use GraphCDN. And we realized that most people send between five to 10 GraphQL requests per page view, 
which I did not expect at all, right? Now, there's obviously some extremes, right? Like, there's the people that use Relay, which is a minority, but they exist. And they, most of the time, they send, like, one point whatever mm -hmm. requests per page on average because they usually just send one per page to load data. But most people don't use Relay, and most people actually send somewhere between five, which blows my mind. I did not expect this. I was like, surely it's like one to two, right? But no, it's like five to ten. And that in turn means that actually people that look at even their P50 time or their P95 time, that time is pretty useless. Because if you have five to ten requests per page, I forgot what the calculation is, but it's like 96% of your users are going to experience a page load time that's slower than your right. P50 time. Right, And it's like the median P50 time, except everybody hits a time that's worse than the P50 time just because you're sending 5 to 10 graphical requests per page. You just have to assume that you're the person who hit the P99 that day and how pissed <laughs> you'd be. And then you'd be exactly. motivated to fix it, you know? Yep. Because, uh, you know, would you, wish, would you wish a P99 on your worst enemy? That's your request of question. <laughs> <man. laughs> yep, exactly. So, how do you actually do observability on your federated graph at Netflix? Like, how do the developers get insights into their parts of the schema and how that part of the schema is performing? A lot of it is based just on, like, the amazing work that the teams have been doing there for years, right, for observability. So, like, the um, tracing, I find, is just, like, so important, especially with GraphQL uh, and especially with Federation, just seeing what service called which service response times between uh, services is really important. In general, though, I think for observability, thinking in terms of queries is super important. So if you're using things like persisted queries or persisted documents or whatever, observing those rather than your general GraphQL endpoint, I think is a fairly easy way to actually see what's going on. I'm not the biggest fan of per resolver observability just because there's so many things that can go wrong there, like especially using data loader. Most GraphQL APIs use a data loader pattern, which like batches and kind of defers calls to underlying services or databases, which is usually the expensive part. So if you just observe resolver times, most of them will respond almost instantly, but they actually queued up something expensive to be executed later. So it's a bit tricky to um, observe resolvers themselves. So I think if you can, if you have a, a limited amount of queries that you have persisted, if you can actually have dashboards for those queries, they give you a, like a really good observability for not that much effort. And then of course, tracing, there's a ton of tracing products out there, but it's, uh, it's a great way to observe graphical queries too. And there's plugins for almost all GraphQL libraries too, um, which is amazing. And then I guess my next tip that I kind of touched upon is most of the time spent in GraphQL queries is spent calling external services or loading data from databases. And those are the important part you want to observe. Usually it's like, given this GraphQL query, like what actually happened? Oh, you made five SQL queries and five service calls. And usually the worst offenders are something that are N plus ones or a service call that's slow. So if you're to optimize for something, I'd optimize for having visibility into external calls that happened during a query. And tracing can be a shortcut for that usually. Yeah, tracing would be pretty good. Or also not writing all your logic within your resolvers, right? Like having like service layers. So you don't actually have to worry about GraphQL tooling, actually. You just, you just implement observability on like whatever classes you created to do some data access. That could help, too. You know, you just get around the whole like resolver worry. That's a good point. Um, I want uh, you guys' thoughts on this. So I have nightmares about this. I'm a big fan of also having your, as you said, Avi, uh, having your domain logic, you know, like a nice service layer, unit tested good OOP or functions, and then having a GraphQL layer call that. But then something I, I, I realized over the years is that it's kind of in tension with the data loader pattern sometimes. Depending if you see data loaders as a GraphQL concept or a domain concept, if you have this beautiful like function that you call to know, I don't know, if we take, um, if a product is available, for example, if there's inventory, in reality, in the GraphQL world, you'll need to data load that to batch calls, for example, hundreds of products. And usually people do that in a resolver. They batch that, but then you need to extract some of data loading out of your service layer, or you need to push your data loader in your service context and always think in terms of like plurals, right? <laughs> like our products yeah. in the very, very, So that weird tension is 
makes it super annoying to try and have that isolated service layer. It also needs to be user aware, permission aware. So I so agree with you and I try to push that as far as I can, but in practice, there's it's really hard. I don't know if you've you felt the same pains before. Definitely felt the same pains, but you kind of have to live with the pain if your service layer serves a REST API as well, or you're doing the multi-clients that are not GraphQL. I think what you what you end up having having is like you have like like execution context, right? Where you're like, okay, like I have this same function, but it's a data loader. I pass it into the data loader. I got this one for my express app and I got this one for internal calls within workers and stuff inside the same container. So man, there's just so many ways to skin all this stuff when it comes to yep. like these kind of topics right here, which is, I guess, is what DevOps people like really argue about more. And we're over here arguing about GraphQL JS and stuff. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> I actually have a question for you too. How do you two feel about the data loader pattern? It sounds like it solves some problems, but it also introduces some others, particularly if you want to have, it sounds like it has an impact on the quality of the architecture, would maybe be a fair summary, I think, where suddenly you're not really sure, does that go into my service layer? Does that go into my GraphQL layer? It's kind of a GraphQL concern. If you didn't have GraphQL, you probably wouldn't have data loaders. Kind of the, the flexibility or the maybe the graph nature of GraphQL really requires you to use data loaders, I guess. Have any of you seen any better solutions? Like, I don't actually know if any exists. I'm asking a question that I don't know the answer to. I've always used data loaders, but is there is there alternatives? Do people use other things in data loaders that work differently? If you have a GraphQL native app, you don't have to use data loaders for a long time because you like build your app with the data model in mind and GraphQL in mind. So you could probably like, you know, finagle your way not to use data loaders mm. by design. Like You like kind of go through it. But if you're inheriting like this big ass thing, then you have no control and like yeah. you have to use data source. No, that's a good point. I've seen that's a few years ago, but I, I've seen this GraphQL server which kind of like looked at leaf fields and kind of preloaded data if a collection was asked from the parent field, for example. And that probably works if you have like a single set of queries and you know how your API is used. But yeah, I think it falls apart super quickly. Yeah. The other approach is like the whole SQL auto-generation from a GraphQL query thing, which like you fetch everything in one SQL query, which can be really great, I think, if you start this way. But if you took a look at like uh, GitHub's code base, you can't just run SQL to get a response, right? There's like thousands of lines to know if a pull request is closed. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's also one of the things that I talk about with Tim, my, my co-founder, who, who you know created GraphQL back in the day that eventually turned into Prisma. And they basically realized that this whole GraphQL database turned into GraphQL thing that you need a layer in between. You can't just expose your, your database over there, right? Just like you said with the pull request close status, you cannot just expose your database over the air. That works for about two weeks. And then you have a use case where you really want to have a layer in between. You really want your database and your API to be separate. And I thought that, that was really interesting. On the other hand, what's also interesting is that Azura is really popular. We have quite a lot of customers on Azura. And Azura, I think, has kept going down this path of sort of helping people build GraphQL APIs more easily. And from what I understand, they've added a lot of functionality to make it easier to extend the API once you actually need to, which I think might actually be the better level of abstraction than what GraphQL had back in the day, which was really just your database from a UI turned into an API. No, you're right. And I, like modern databases too have like so many features I wasn't aware of before I started kind of criticizing these approaches. It turns out everything's possible. But now the, <laughs> the question is, like, what do you want your development workflow to look like, right? I like having code. <laughs> I like I like writing code and being able to read code. It's like it's kind of the same reason we don't store everything in stored procedures, uh, for example. Like it's possible, but that's not how people prefer to write software these days. So I think it's it depends on how you want to architect your thing. I'm, I think database these days are super powerful. They can run authorization policies for you and everything. Yeah. I mean, Benji, we had Benji Gilamo in one of the last episodes, and he talked about PostgreSQL for a while, right? And I learned a lot about PostgreSQL in the episode. I was like, I did not know that PostgreSQL can do all of these things. Yeah, Benji is a, is a wizard. For sure. <laughs> this solution is super elegant, for sure. For sure. I mean, for all for all these things, you know, like we always talk about 
that's one of the funny things working to GraphQL over the years is I've gotten to explore a lot of general software principles because people will ask like, hey, how do you do, do authorization in GraphQL? And it's always like, like, how do you do authorization in general? Like these are all, or caching, like these are hard things that have never truly been figured out and they're not figured out in GraphQL either, which makes a ton of sense, right? So we talk a lot about GraphQL, but a lot of these problems are just like harder problems in general, uh, which is nice because we get to tackle them from GraphQL lenses, but I don't expect GraphQL to solve any of these <laughs> big issues by itself. Yes. What would you say the principles are that you've kind of learned over these years? You know, just gaining, obviously gaining experience, moving to bigger and better opportunities. Yeah, that's a good question. I think the, the main one is try to have GraphQL do as little as possible, right? Like GraphQL schemas is a great tool, like algorithm to resolve queries. Awesome. But then we'll have a tendency, especially if you work at a layer to, hey, like exactly what we said, like we'll solve authorization at that layer. We'll solve just like pretty much everything at that layer. And I think if you can, if you're in a, especially at big companies, definitely consult with those experts at your companies with at observability, use their tools, authorization, try to push down anything that's domain related to the domain owners. So it's kind of that fine balance. Like you want to leverage GraphQL's power and what you can run and execute at the GraphQL layer, that's fine. But yeah, I think pushing down these hard problems on the teams that are best equipped to handle them is a good idea. So that's a big one. And then the other one is like just to keep things simple as long as you can. If I were to advise any like smaller company or even individuals, like you probably don't need any of what you're seeing <laughs> right now on Twitter. Uh, you can take it slow and tooling, like local tooling in your service can go like very far to avoid like any like the federation problems. Yeah. Be patient and keep things simple would be my, my main advice. <laughs> I love that. I think that stems from the history of GraphQL as well. If you think about GraphQL was invented at Facebook, who have this whole framework called Ent that nobody else has. They've completely invented themselves that does basically the service layer that we were talking about, right? And it, it, it handles getting data, it handles authorization, it handles all of it. And GraphQL was really meant as a, as a query language to access the data that is behind those services. But it was never meant to handle authorization, you know, in the in the context that it was invented, exactly like you're saying, it was sort of like a, I don't want to call it a thin layer because it isn't that thin, but it's like a layer on top rather than the layer that handles everything. And knowing that context, I think that that usage makes a lot of sense, right? Because that's explicitly the context that it was invented for and in. And then Facebook was just like, okay, we're just going to, we can open source this GraphQL thing. This end thing is just our our internal tooling. Like, we're, we're not going to open source this. And so... That really makes sense. And I really love keeping it simple. I mean, it's just a general principle. Keep it simple. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. And if you're listening and you enjoyed all of this, go buy Mark's book, Production Ready GraphQL. I think the domain is what? ProductionReadyGraphQL.com? Book.ProductionReadyGraphQL.com. Yep. Book.ProductionReadyGraphQL.com. Go check that book out. It contains basically all of Mark's contained wisdom in one book that I think pretty much everybody that uses GraphQL production should be reading. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you all in the next episode of GraphQL Radio. Mm -hmm.